we are so blessed this morning to have our friends Dr. Doug and Lisa Weiss with us today. Uh, Dr. Doug has been with us before. It's great to welcome him back. This is Lisa's first time uh, visiting with us. Doug is the founder of the Heart to Heart Counseling Center in Colorado Springs. Uh, he is one of the leading Christian counselors. Uh, in the country today, working with marriages, husbands, wives, working with men and women on issues of sexual purity. Uh, he has been on television, Good Morning America, 2020, Oprah, Dr. Phil, um, appears regularly on Christian television and radio. I leaned over to Doug last night, because you know, he's only like 35, so I said, Doug, I said, how is it possible? Uh, I said, is it true that you authored over 40 books? And he said, it's almost 50 books that he's written. Uh, some of those books are out on the table. I don't, I don't know what's left, you know, the uh, scavengers from last night and the services this morning, but they might have left something on the table. But uh, would you give your very best welcome? I know you just sat down. Would you stand on your feet, give your best welcome to our friend, Dr. Doug Weiss. Amen. Thank you very much. All right. Well, good morning. And I'm glad you guys took your time to get up and enjoy the snow, get to church. Amen. It's an awesome day. It's going to be beautiful out there. It's a great Colorado day. I love it. And so <laughs> let's just pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your spirit, your love, your kindness, your joy, your peace. Who you are is amazing. And we thank you that you're continuing to advance the kingdom. And thank you for all you're doing for this church. Amen. Amen. Well, I've enjoyed being here this weekend, and we've been doing the marriage conference, and, and I understand that uh, you know, some of you were able to come. Now, how many of you here today that you're not currently married to a human being? Oh, wow. The most are in this service. All right. You guys get to, get to know each other. Talk. Figure it out. Okay. Um, don't be afraid to ask. Okay. But, you know, uh, as I was talking to the married people, you know, if, it, if married people have the wrong definition, if they think marriage is between a man and a woman, Okay, which it isn't. It's between God, a man, and a woman. I'll explain that a little bit. Okay? But if, if, you're, if you're not married to another human being, let me, I'm going to tell you what your biblical status is and compare it to your secular status. Your biblical status is you are married without a spouse. Amen. Okay, because you can't be single and saved. Because once you're saved, you're married. Now, if you're saved and married, then you want to think like a married person. You want to act like a married person. You want to have boundaries like a married person so God can trust you to get married. Because, see, if you act like a single, that's the secular definition for your status, and you don't want to act like the world that tells you you're single and you're, you're, you, you own all this and you can do what you want and no one tells you what to do. Listen, if you can't be told what to do, you're, no use, you're useless in the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom's not a democracy, it's a kingdom. And you and I are not the king. There's no voting in the kingdom. It's yes, sir. So if you're married without a spouse, then act married and have boundaries like a married person and you know, surround yourself with some married people so they can check your friends out as they're passing through that stage and all that kind of stuff. It's really good. Amen? So don't think you're single. Don't call yourself single. Don't confess that you're single. Because that's just lying. And the same well, are you single? No, I'm married without a spouse. Well, what do you mean? Well, then you get to witness to him. Say, are you single? Well, that must be lonely. Alone and going to hell. That is awful. Like, wouldn't you rather be married and going to heaven? You know what I'm saying? So I know some of you. So we're going to talk about the, the final creation today. Okay, you know, my story is one of, you know, conceived in adultery, abandoned, abused, put in foster homes, alcohol, drugs, sex addiction. I get all that stuff, okay? I've been free from alcohol and drugs for a long time. I've been free from sex addiction for, gosh, 29 years. And people fly from all over the country and world to come visit me and my team to get free and stay free, okay? So whatever your story is, God is God, and he is a good God. And uh, we have a free app called Dr. Doug's Tips. So if you have a cell phone, Dr. Doug's Tips. That's a marriage tip, a recovery tip, purity tip, all that stuff's there. But I want to talk about the final creation. Now, have you ever gone to a movie where the movie starts at the end? Yes or no? Now, I'm a psychologist. If you don't talk back, I think you're crazy. OK? So have you ever gone to a movie where it starts at the end? Yes or no? Yes. Very good. OK? You know that. And they give you that like two, three, four minute clip. And then it'll say, 
seven days earlier, one month earlier, seven years ago, and then it'll take you back to there and develop the movie and then give you that same scene again and then take you to the conclusion, right? Okay, so you've been through that kind of methodology of communication. And I'm going to do that today. I want to start with the end to show you what God did and how he did what he did. And then I want to take you back through how he did what he did. Y'all okay with that? Oh, it's better than you think. Okay, you're going to learn. You're going to have fun. Okay, I want to take you to the book of Genesis. Okay? I want to read out of chapter 2. And I want to show you what he did. And then I want to show you how he did what he did. So that we can do what he wants us to do. Amen? Amen. All right, good. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, I'm going to start at about verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper, I will make a helper suitable for him. Okay? Now the Lord God formed out of the ground all the beasts of the fields, all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Everyone go, aw. I mean, because basically we have a zookeeper here, he's alone. Okay? Okay, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, he taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now, now, I want to show you what he did, and then I want to show you how he did it, okay? Now, to show you what he did, I need a couple that's been married for quite a while. You got one around here? You, how long y'all been married? How long y'all been married? Well, you qualify. Come up here. <laughs> 43 years. Yeah, give him a hand. Oh, they're so cute, too. Look at them. <laughs> okay, what's your name, sir? Bruce. That's easy. What's yours? Linda, okay. So let me show you what God did, okay? So God makes Bruce, okay? He makes him perfect, just the perfect amount of hair, right? Wonderful, okay? So he makes him in his divine image, okay? But at some point, God looked at Bruce and said, it's not good to be alone. And he already had made Linda. He already trusted her with parents and fed her and clothed her, educated her, trained her. Got her ready, right? And so Linda was the answer, right? Because women is a solution. Women's a solution for almost anything, amen? Okay? <laughs> women was created as a solution, okay? So was man, but his solution was to work, okay? So now, now I want you, Bruce, to grab Karen's hand there like that. Yep, okay? Now, now this is what the world will tell you marriage is between a man and a woman. And they get in a lot of trouble here trying to figure out who the boss is and all that kind of crazy stuff. But this is not marriage from a biblical perspective. See, so what God did is he, he made Bruce, and then he made Karen, and then he himself grabbed their hands. And then God himself made his marriage on earth as it is in heaven, a trinity on earth as it is in heaven. He made man in his own image. Let us make man in our own image, a three-faced being that loves and serves. Amen? See, when you understand that the final creation in Scripture was not woman as wonderful she, as she is, but you'll read the Bible the way you're taught the Bible. Okay? Woman was not the final creation. Marriage was the final creation masterpiece of the Almighty God. Amen? Are you all with me? Okay, give, give them a hand. They're so cute. Now see, when you understand that marriage is the final creation of God, it changes the entire scripture. Because God is in every relationship you're in. Husband, wife, child, teacher, student, every relationship the father's in. Amen? Does that make sense? Okay. So the final creative act of God is this trinity on earth that loves and serves and connects to one another. Amen? That's the final creation. 
That doesn't mean if, you have, if you're not married to another adult that you're less than. Not at all. That just means you're either getting prepared or God saved you for himself. That's okay either way. All right, now, so <laughs> don't get all weird about all that stuff. Take your time. Because marriage, really, and you've got to understand, the purpose of marriage is to kill you. So once you get married, it's going to kill you. So I know you're aching to die, but, okay, ask any married person. All right, so it's awesome. There's nothing like it. It's just like parenting. It's so much fun. And it's rewarding. And everybody should do that, right? Okay, so now I want to go into the final creation here because I want to take you now back. That's the end of the movie. The end of the movie is a trinity on earth. Okay, now I want to go back. I love the very first scripture, in the beginning. Now I'm in Genesis chapter 1. So if you were in Genesis 2, flip your page. And I want to show you some principles here about creation that God does. Okay, because God is an amazing creation, a creator, is he not? He's an amazing creator. Okay, very powerful, very, it's wonderful. So let me give you some insight here. In, in verse 3, it said, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Right. Instantaneous. Instantaneous creation. Are you getting me? Yeah. Okay, we'll keep going. Uh, let the expanse between the waters separate the water, so he created land. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and the dry ground appeared. And it was so. Okay, and he called the dry ground land. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, and there was vegetables. Now, it's really fun, because God creates things in order. Because you need vegetables to feed the mammals. Because right? <laughs> if we made the mammals first, it would have been a bad day for the mammals. Okay? So he always does things in order, including his final creation. One step before the next step. Does that make sense? But it's instantaneous so far. And then God said, let there be lights in the sky. And there was, we call those the moon and the sun. Let the waters teem with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth. So, we, uh, so there, there became the birds and all that. And then God said, let the land produce living creatures according to the kind, livestock creatures that move along the ground. We call that beef and wild animals, each according to a kind. And it was so. Now, can you imagine the amount of creativity and wisdom and power it took to speak, I don't know, hundreds of thousands or millions of creatures into instantaneous existence with the complex biological systems that they have. All at one moment. Out of the ground. Like that's, a I'm going to watch that DVD. I want to see that one. And I'm sure when you go to heaven, they're going to give you a few DVDs. I think the creation is going to be one of them. Okay, I want to see that one. Okay, so he creates the animals. And then down in verse 26, he says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish in the sea, etc. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. Now, what's interesting to me is as we go into the next chapter of Genesis, God expands what he actually did. But he only expands it on his final creation. He didn't explain how he made a whale. He didn't even explain how he made grass. He didn't explain how he made light. Why? Because we are not bright enough, even if he tried to explain it. And it was so, is about as bright as we are. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, so that's all I need to know. It's like talking to a two-year-old and trying to explain something. That's just the way it is, honey. Okay, okay, and that's just what God was saying. So, and it was so. But in this situation, God creating his masterpiece suspended the way he created and did it differently. Now, listen to the scripture based on what we just said through the whole book of Genesis 1. And I want you to guess at what the next few words should say if God was consistent the way he was creating Okay, let's read this. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And the next few words should be what? And it was so. Poof. There she is. (laughs) 
Now, why did God change the method of creating when he decided to create a trinity on earth as it is in heaven? Why did he go from instantaneous to now process? Do you see what I'm saying? It's a different creative principle. Now, how many of you have utilized the process methodology with God? It's taken you a while to learn some things. Oh, no, you guys were instantaneously brilliant? (laughs) You got saved and you were instantaneously brilliant? No, it takes a process to become quasi-brilliant with God. Amen? Okay? And so what happened is we see Adam being created and the life of God being breathed into him, but there was something he was missing that he needed before he received what God had for him. See, God sometimes has to get something in you before he can give something to you. Are you all with me? Okay, and some of you, you might be in a process today or this week or this year or this last decade of God trying to put something in your heart, in your character, in your nature, so he can trust you with what he designed you for. Does that make sense? Okay, and if you're in that struggle, die as quick as possible. (laughs) Give it up. It's not worth the fight. If you got an idol, throw it down and walk away. Amen? Amen. It's just not worth what what God wants to give you is so much better than what you hold on to. Have you ever learned that lesson? Okay, so it's like the story of a dad who had a little girl, kind of like the one we saw up here, had a little girl. And she, somewhere along the way, she got these plastic pearls. And she loved these plastic pearls. She wore them everywhere, every day. They were her favorite thing. Everywhere she went, the plastic pearls were around her neck. And one day she was going to bed and her dad tucked her in. And she's laying in bed and her dad says this to her. He says, and he says Susie, I want you to give me your plastic pearls. And she goes, like forever? <laughs> he goes, yeah, forever. I want you to give me your plastic pearls forever. She loved her daddy with all her heart. But she was confused. She was heartbroken. Why would a dad who loves me want to take away my favorite thing? Why would he want my pearls? He's not going to look good with those pearls. I don't understand what you're asking, daddy. But she didn't need to understand because she trusted her daddy. So this little girl takes off her little necklace and she, with tears in her eyes, And the dad takes the pearls and he sticks them in his pocket. And then with his other hand, he brings out a little packet and he opens it up and it's a real string of pearls. And he gives it to his favorite little girl. See, sometimes what you're holding on to is plastic compared to what God wants to give to you. Amen? Amen? So you don't want to hold on to plastic. You want the real deal. So Adam... Adam wasn't ready for the real deal. See, God had to put something in Adam he didn't have by just being alive. Now, I've preached this hundreds of times and never seen this. I've never seen God raising up Adam and giving Adam skills he needed before he got his bride. And that's why God had to suspend all creative order to slow it down to give him something. Because Adam didn't come equipped with it. He had to learn it. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, so let's walk through this. So God says it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. But before he made Eve, he did this. Now the Lord God formed out of all the ground, all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. And he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all livestock, the birds of the air and all the beasts of the field. Okay, so now... Let's go back. Let's look at this. What was God doing with Adam? Okay, the first thing God gave Adam was what? Responsibility, a job. 
And I can tell you, if you're not married to a man, if you're looking to marry a man, make sure he has a job. Because if he doesn't have a job, God's not with him. Because the first thing God will give a man is a job. You don't have to ask if he's matured just to see if he's got a job. All the men know exactly what I'm talking about. Because as a dad, the first thing I want to know, do you got a job, son? Then I'll start talking to you about other things. But if you ain't working, you ain't even near God. Because my God will give you a job before he gives you a woman. And not an education, he'll give you a job. (laughs) That was for somebody. Okay. (laughs) So praise God. Okay, so I want to give you the scene. Okay, so God himself. There's hundreds of thousands or a million animals. Because this is before any were extinct. They're all eating well, living good, all that kind of stuff's going on. Okay, so God would hand select maybe a few hundred or maybe a thousand animals, okay? And then he would take this kind of tribe, kind of like Noah's Ark, and God would walk up to Adam's little house. Okay, now God is not, God's not a late riser. God gets up early in the morning. Okay, so he'd knock on Adam's door. Well, that sounds better over here. Come on, Adam, get up. Time for work. Right? So he'd bring the animals up, Adam come out, and God would sit down. And he would just stay there all day with Adam, watching his son work. Now, he didn't help his son. You know, because sometimes Adam's over here, and he's kind of like, wow, that's kind of an interesting looking thing. I don't know what you're thinking, but you got any ideas? No, you're not going to help? Wow, man. All right, zebra. That's as good as I can do, buddy. <laughs> Next. Wow, man, you're not really that attractive, buddy. Um, hmm, bless your heart. Uh, aardvark, that's all I got for you, buddy. That's what comes, that comes to my mind. I'm sorry, buddy, but that's, that's what you got, right? So God was giving Adam several things. One, he was giving him a work ethic. Every day, six days a week, all day. And if, before you get married, you better learn how to work because marriage is work. And it's seven days a week. Amen? Amen. So if you don't want to work, don't get married. (laughs) Amen? Because marriage is work. The other thing that God was giving to Adam was he was giving him creativity. See, Adam wasn't reading a book to name the animals. He never saw a book. He had to create the name. Do you see what I'm saying? That takes longer than just reading a book. Okay? He had to create. He had to become creative. He had to solve a problem. Okay, because this is a big problem in the kingdom. Because here we are in the kingdom, and all the animals are over here, and they're kind of hanging out together, and they go, hey, do you know who you are? No, I don't know who I am. Do you got a name yet? No, I don't got a name yet. You don't got no name? I got no name either. I don't know what to call you. I don't want to call you. All right, Fred, we'll just hang out. Let's talk. They didn't know who they were. Right? So what would happen is this little tribe of animals would come up. One day there's this little cute animal inside the tribe. And he's coming up, and he's so excited. Him and his wife are so excited, they finally get to go up to meet the man. That's where the, the phrase, the man, came from. The man. And so, so they're going to meet the man, right? And so he kind of pop up there, and they're kind of like that. And so Adam's kind of calm, and kind of looks up. The, and they're so cute, this little couple. They're about like this big. He looks at him, and he goes, Squirrel. I'm squirrel, I'm squirrel, I'm squirrel, I'm squirrel. And they go back to the tribe, they go, I'm squirrel, what are you? Oh, you don't know yet? I'm squirrel. But see, what God was teaching Adam, it's a couple things. One is, he's not here for himself. That he was created with greater strength and greater wisdom to be a servant to those who had less than him. Come on, church, that's better than you're responding. See, God was putting in Adam a servant DNA. When you wake up in the morning, son, it's not about you. Get up and start giving life and identity to everything in the kingdom. See, men, your supernatural gift, you want to be a superman, an X-man, something more powerful than you think you are? You already are that. It's your voice to give identity to every person around you. See, he was giving identity to everything around him before Eve was made. 
God was training him how to use his power to give identity. Y'all with me? Okay. See, men, you have a certain place in your children's heart that no other person does. You tell them they're amazing. You tell them they're powerful. You tell them they can break curses. You tell them they can do anything they want to do, and they'll believe you. Mom can say it all day long. Doesn't have the same power. My son would play basketball every time I make a shot. He'd look at me. My wife was sitting right next to me. She probably drove him there. <laughs> because he wanted to see his dad's response to him. You tell your little girl she's amazing. My daughter's now, she's going to turn, she's 21. She's going to graduate in about a month. When she's about 16, I wrote a note. You're amazing. Love dad. And I taped it to her door. It's still there. Because neither one of us can tear it down because it's still true. <laughs> your voice, men, to your employees, to your friends, to your wife, is the power God gave you to raise things up. How you use your voice, powerful. See, Adam was learning. It's not about me. It's about them. I'm not here for me. I'm a servant to you, squirrel. How can I help you today, sir? I'll give you identity. There it is. Now see, this servant DNA was becoming so deep in Adam's nature because it was every day for what? Weeks? Months? Years? Decades to name every bird, every mammal, everything. That took a long time. Adam was not alone for a day or a week. Adam was alone for a long time learning one lesson. I am a servant. Are you all with me? Yeah. Now see, I know that he was learning this lesson because this became reflexive to Adam. Now what I mean by reflexive is it's without thinking. Okay, you have reflexes, amen? So suppose today you were driving earlier when the roads were actually wet, and you were driving down the highway, and you're a little closer to that 18-wheeler than you should be, and he hits his brakes really hard, and you start sliding. Now, something's going to come out of you that's in you. That's your reflex. And hopefully it's, Jesus! Hopefully that day you don't have some other God in your heart with a limited amount of letters. Because you don't serve that God, you serve the living God. The living God can stop the truck <laughs> or stop you. Either way, or put some angels in between you. Okay? You'll have some bruised angels in heaven. They'll know your name. Yeah. I, you see this? That's from you, buddy. That's when you didn't die. I took the hit for you, man. Okay, you'll have some angels who have some attitude with you, okay? But, see, here I know that God had made a servant man by the way Adam reflexively responds to Eve. Watch this scene. It's another day. This is a special day. Adam's named hundreds of thousands of more animals. Years have gone by. He's matured significantly. Now what's happening is See, usually God comes up and you can see kind of the, the tribe of animals kind of expansively behind God. But this day was different. Adam's hanging out with his orange juice because he's learned to get up before God. Get ready for God because if you ain't ready for God, it doesn't go as good. Okay? So now Adam's hanging out and he sees God walking up. God's walking up and God's like, Adam's over here. He's looking at God walking up. And it looks like he's alone. God's walking up. See, there's something behind God, but God ain't letting it be seen. God walks up to the house. How's it going, Adam? Good, good, good. Good, son. You're doing good. I'm real proud of you. you know, I, got, I got something for you today. You need to step back just a little bit. There she is. Oh, my God. There's a naked woman of God, my wife. But see, Adam was such a servant 
the DNA was complete. He was finally fully baked. You ladies know when, you're, when your cake is baked because it's different than when you put it in. See, Adam was different. He learned it's not about him. His reflex, let's read his reflex. She comes up to the man, and the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Because it's about you, honey. It's about giving you identity, knowing who you are. I am going to name you. I'm not going to worry about my needs. It's your needs that come first, because I'm here to serve you. Why are the women only ones saying amen? That's pathetic. Do you know why you're bigger, you're stronger, you need less sleep? It's because you were created to serve. That's what I've been telling my son since he's been born. Son, why were you made? To serve, that's right. Why are you stronger and faster, need less sleep than your mom and your sister? Because I'm a servant, that's right, go take out the garbage. <laughs> See, men need to know who they are, because if you got the wrong position, you will have the wrong outcome. If you're in the wrong position, you'll have the wrong attitude. Do you see what I'm saying? And see, Adam was not worthy of her until he became a servant. And when he became a servant, God entrusted him with her. See, the very fabric, the very foundation of marriage is based on a man being a servant. Not a man being a god and not a man being a king. That's secular and that's a lie. See, when God created marriage, he created a trinity on earth, which means there's already a king in that trinity. And his name is God Almighty, Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. And if you ever saw him, you'd bow down in worship because he's worthy. You wouldn't try to rule a woman because that's his daughter. See, when you are married to a Christian and you are a Christian, <laughs> you have two relationships with God. You have God the Father relationship, and you have God the Father-in-law relationship. <laughs> so many of us don't pray to the Father-in-law God, and you should, around 5 o'clock on the way home. Dear Father-in-law God, I'm about to enter the zone. The zone where the Holy One lives and the Holy Children live. I need an attitude of gratitude. I need to be a servant of the Most High God. I need to show them what it looks like to be a man of God on planet Earth so they will rise up and serve you well. So when I go home, there's a fragrance of service. Right? That's the man's prayer. Woman's prayer is maybe you're at work, maybe you're at home. Father-in-law God, your holy son's going to walk through that door. He's been beaten and bruised. He's been called names. He's been pushed around so that he could bless our family today. Lord, I want to kiss him so hard that every wound and every name goes away. I want to remind him that he is married to the holy woman of God and that I'm a grateful woman of God and to remind him that he was smart picking me. Because, Father-in-law God, I want you to be pleased on how I serve him. Father-in-law God, I want you to be pleased on the way I serve her. And the way I serve her or serve him is not dependent on how they serve me because I'm not keeping score, I'm winning. Amen. Are you all with me? Okay, so when you understand that you're a servant in your marriage, now you've got the right role. And if you're not married yet, you better learn how to serve now. Because marriage is about service. When you marry, you're not marrying to be served. You're marrying and saying, I will serve you till death. You're servant, man. That's different than secular, isn't it? That's why they have the outcomes they have. And those Christians who believe what they believe have the outcomes that they have. Amen? All right, so... What you want to know is, isn't that a fun story, right? Going back, you see what God had to make a servant to make his final creation marriage. Okay? And if you have that DNA, you can have an incredible marriage. Okay? You can, you can last the seasons of frustration and, and the things that life will bring to you and all that kind of stuff. Okay? Now, as we go through this, and, and I want to add just one more thing before we close. See, many of us, 
Now, let me ask you this. How many of you would like to really have the supernatural, now think before you raise your hand, the supernatural favor of God on your life? Okay? Now, I'm not going to ask you to throw money at me. That's not me. I don't, that's not my thing. I want to teach you how to have the supernatural favor of God. I've got to take about three minutes. Okay? How many of you have children? Many of you. Okay. And if you don't, you probably have a child that you like. Okay? That's before you have kids. No, it's kidding. Okay. So if you have this child and some coach or teacher or friend or neighbor acknowledges the gifting of your child and says, listen, your kid's special. And I see that gift and I have that gift. I know how to take that gift from here to here. I want to help you with your child because they're amazing. How do you feel towards that person? How do you feel? No, talk to me. Yeah, you like that person, right? Even if they're a little rough around the edges, they kind of smoke once in a while. You're like, ah, oh, cool. You like my kid, I like you. Okay, now suppose you have that, a, a child and they have a gift, but the coach puts them down and says, you're not going to amount to anything. Teacher says, you're stupid, you can't do anything. You'll... How do you feel towards that person? Do you like that person? No favor. Okay. See, how you, when you love who God loves, God likes you. If you love the lost, he likes you. If you love your spouse and you acknowledge that's my laundry, those are my dishes, I'll get those, honey. It's not, you're supposed to help, not do everything. You're a helpmate. You're not supposed to do everything. Now, if you're at home alone and, and he's working all day, and yeah, you should pick up more than he should pick up. Okay? But if it's kind of an equal thing, try to make it equal. Or at least, men, you're stronger. Okay? You get up earlier. Get it done before she wakes up. Mess her up. <laughs> oh, my God. There's a man of God in the house. I woke up. And <laughs> it's done. Well, what are we going to do today? Oh, we'll find something, honey. <laughs> I didn't save all that energy for no reason. <laughs> okay. Praise God. So what you want to do is you want to, if you want to have the favor of God, really serve those around you. Serve those around you. We, we have a servant God. Is, does he not serve us with incredible blessings and things? He doesn't have to. He chooses to. Is he not greater than us? He is. Is he not stronger than us, more powerful than us? He is. And yet he gently serves us. Amen? So let's close our eyes for a moment. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Just close your eyes. First question is the most important question. You know, some of you came to church today and, and you've been kind of moving towards Jesus. You know, you're just, you're just moving towards him. You're like, today's a day I have to make him Lord of my life. I've never made him Lord of my life. I want to serve him. I want to give my life to him. And you've never done it before. And today's a day you want to say, you know what, Dr. Weiss, I want to give my heart to Jesus. Now, I'm not going to ask you to do anything except just raise your hand. If that's you today, I just want you to raise your hand and say, yep, I need to give my heart to Jesus. I see you, ma'am. I see you, ma'am. I see you, ma'am, sir, sir. See you, ma'am. There's many today. I see you, sir. Oh, bless the Lord. Okay, let's put the hands down just for a minute. Now, there's about 12 people here who want to make that decision today. So I want to ask you 12 to do one thing with me and with everyone in the congregation so you don't feel awkward. We're all going to pray. And you need to pray out loud. So everyone's going to pray out loud. Okay? And I want you to pray this prayer after me, and then Pastor will come up a little bit later and maybe give you more information. Okay? Everyone pray this prayer out loud. Say, Jesus, Jesus forgive, me forgive me of my sins, my mistakes. My mistakes. I, accept I accept your blood, your death, your death. As, full as full payment of everything I've done or will do. I ask you to be Lord of me from this day forth. In Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come into me. Be my teacher. Father, be my Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, many of you, this was the first time you prayed that prayer. Pastor's going to ask you to get some information. Get that information. Get in a local church. This is a great church. Start reading your Bible. Start in the book of John. Do that kind of thing. But let's keep our eyes closed just for one more minute. Because there's a lot of children in God here, and i got two questions for you. Number one, did God say something to you today? 
If he said something to you, just raise your hand. Many of you, many of you. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Last question. Did God nudge you? He's been trying to get you to do something, and you've been kind of taking your time. And he's saying to you, do it. Start that company. Start that ministry. Get involved in church. Get involved in your community. And that's you today. I just want you to raise your hand. I'm not going to, that's it. I'll just raise your hand. That's me. That's me. I got to get to it. Got to get to it. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Okay, yeah, many of you here. Okay, and you want to get to that because God wants to strengthen you through service so he can put something in you so he can give something to you. It's to bless you. Father God, I thank you for the servants in the house. I thank you for that so many that are. And I thank you for those that got to step it up to get more muscular, to move from kind of watching Christianity to getting into it, serving and becoming who they're supposed to be in Christ Jesus. Lord, I bless you for this church and all that you're doing. In Jesus' mighty name, Pastor Glenn.